Ah. Um, oh, I have to turn the volume up. Okay, so we are recording. Uh, I don't know why I'm turning the volume up because nobody can speak at the moment anyway. Um, so if you have the uh, the common lists and rivals in Stein book, this oh, and I have to start to start that recording. I have to start this. The, the, the thing will be probably easier to see um, okay. in the, when I start this little camera. So maybe, yeah. So the, the high resolution camera, okay, it's, it's, it's online learning. Um, what lecture notes section does this? I've got the I haven't got the lecture notes written yet uh, for this week. So usually I try to post them in advance, but I'm behind. I still haven't finished the the fast Fourier transform notes, and that looks like it's that, the little camera looks like it's crooked. But but okay, um, we're just gonna have to go with that. Maybe. Is that better? Um, also, I have uh, maybe not. Uh, okay. Um, so no lecture notes yet. Um, but this stuff is is very classic. So it's it's um, the the way I was teaching Huffman's algorithm. Uh, I haven't actually seen anybody else teach it that way. So um, that's a bit new. Minimum spanning trees. Mm, okay, I'm going to do a third algorithm, um, which, so we are recording here. We are recording here, which is a bit unusual because uh, most people in the book, they just cover cross goals and prims. I'm going to cover cross goals, prims, and Baruchas which is not much different, but requires a little bit of thinking about, um, about data structures. Yay, data structures. OK, so uh, people have said you can't really see this, this, this graph. Maybe it will be better when if I go over it with the new black marker. So. Um, before we do that, a little bit of background on minimum spanning trees. These are greedy, the, the, the minimum spanning tree algorithm, uh, construction algorithms are greedy algorithms. They're sort of the classic greedy algorithms. Um, in the book, they start, I think, with interval scheduling, which is super easy. Minimum spanning trees are not quite that easy, but they're easier than Huffman's algorithm. Um, I mean, Huffman's algorithm is pretty basic, but the proof of correctness is not obvious. That's why. It, Probably Shannon didn't see it, and Hoffman, it took him a while. Um, <clears throat> so this, the, the arguments for the proof of correctness require a little bit of, of graph theory. <clears throat> um, but that's good because I think you've seen graph theory before a little bit. Um, and it will get us into this mode of the, the standard form for proof of correctness of a greedy algorithm always goes, hmm, before we do, remember in for Huffman's algorithm, we had my friend Jeremy, who was going to show up uh, for the sorting stuff, for merging the sorting list. We were going to have to try to do the first step by ourselves, and then Jeremy was going to show up and say, okay, I can take it from here. You haven't like messed things up terribly. I can, I can still reach an optimal solution. So, Today we're going to I'm going to pound this in that um, what you the argument goes okay before you have taken any steps your empty subsolution can be extended to an optimal solution okay imagine that after i steps your subsolution your current subsolution can be extended to an optimal solution s show that for now now you make this greedy choice for your i plus first step, show that for that uh, your your subsolution after i plus one steps can still be extended to an optimal solution. Maybe the same one, maybe also s, or maybe s prime. 
And usually how you do this is, 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 is called an exchange argument. So you say, okay, well, if I do something, if S did, if so after I steps, my sub-solution could be extended to S, which is optimal. Now I take another step after I plus one steps, maybe S didn't do the same thing on the I plus first step, but whatever S did, I can sort of take S and change it around and say, okay, I still get an optimal solution, S prime. So this is the exchange argument. Now you don't have S, obviously. S is an optimal solution. If you had an optimal solution, you wouldn't be doing this. But um, this is how you argue. So you say, okay, before I do anything, I haven't messed up. Suppose that I haven't messed up to the i step, then I show that on the i plus first step, I don't mess up. Then by induction, I don't mess up. Okay, so it's, it's like, you know, before we do anything, Jeremy can come and fix the, and Jeremy can come and find out some optimal solution. Uh, the other way around, S can be modified into S prime. I mean, technically, okay, you can, you can, you can do it the other way um, because you just do the reverse thing, but, but we say that S can be changed into S prime. Okay, so um, we're gonna see three examples of these proofs. Uh, one, which is the first proof of grant is pretty easy. The second one is not so easy. The third one is just like the second one. Okay, so let's go with uh, Kruskal's algorithm. So if people wanna look this up in the index or something, Oh yeah, this is much easier to see, right? Kruskal's algorithm. Okay, so minimum spanning trees, you have a graph um, and the edges have weights, okay? So you can imagine that you are like a county planner and you have a bunch of little towns and they're connected by dirt roads and you wanna pave some of the roads such that you can get from any town to any other town only along paved roads. Now each road has a cost to pave it and you want to pave it such that um, you spend the minimum amount of money. Okay, now this comes up, that's usually the kind of motivation you give, um, but it also comes up for example, uh, where you just want to connect everything and you don't care about sort of redundancies or latencies, like how long it takes you to get from one town to the other along the paved roads. You just want everything to be connected. So, <coughs> okay. um, so you can also imagine, for example, you're, um, you're setting up a lighting display and you want to, you want to have power to all of the lights. And so you want to put cables and once things are connected, it doesn't matter if um, sort of how far they are from the source, they still get power. Um, so, I mean, like there are advantages to using series and serial and parallel connections and stuff, whatever. Okay, we just, you're, you're a Christmas tree and you want all the lights to come on. Okay, now, um, so, so this is the problem. You wanna find a, a subgraph that connects everything. So this is why it's called spanning. It's called, it's a tree because if you had a cycle in it on Minecraft Redstone, okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, if, if you had a cycle, you could take out one of the edges and not disconnect anything. So the minimum cost, as long as the weights are uh, positive, the minimum cost subgraph that connects everything is a tree. So it's a spanning tree and you want it to have minimum cost. So it's a minimum spanning tree, okay? Um, so this is your job. You have to find one of these things. Okay, so um, if we had more time, I would actually do this whole Socratic method thing and, and that, like we did with Hoffman is saying, oh, well, what are you gonna do first? But um, just to sort of plow through cross goals and also because there are lots of different minimum spanning tree algorithms. 
I'm only going to show you, well, I'm definitely going to show you two. Maybe I'm going to be able to show you three. And uh, because I also want to get to how you implement these things, which is also very cool. Um, cross goals, I don't know if you can, okay, so I'm going to go through this again. Oh, I spent all that time drawing this stuff. No. Well, it's not that hard to redraw. So this is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. This is 4, 11, 8, 1. 2, 10, 9, 14, 4, 6, 2, 8, 7, 7. Okay, not sure if that's, is that easier to read? And um, this line also exists. Easier to read? Okay. Um, oh, so it's environmentally friendly I'm using. Environmentally unfriendly, I'm using up more markers, but it does make things easy to read. Um, okay, so cross goals algorithm, what you do, you take all of the edges and you sort them by weight. Um, so, and you, you take by increasing non-decreasing weight, and then you're going to take the you're going to process them in this order. And for each edge, you're going to take it. And if you can add it, and it doesn't break your tree. So breaking a tree mean, um, well, actually, you're not going to have a tree. You're going to have a forest. A collection of trees is called a forest. This should be easy to remember. Um, <clears throat> if you add it, and it creates a cycle, then it breaks your forest. So you're not going to, you, you can't add it. You throw it away. It's incompatible with your sub-solution so far. If you can add it and it doesn't create a cycle, then you add it. Okay, so let's just run through uh, cross calls algorithm. Um, what is the cheapest edge? Anybody? It is the edge with cost one, right? Uh, H to G. Okay. Okay. Yes. H to G. Yes. Okay. Does it create a cycle? No, because we don't have any other edges yet. So we're going to add this. Okay. Can you see that? Is it red? Yes. Okay. Okay. What is the, well, there's actually a tie for things with cost two. So which one do we want to, uh, you know, whoever speaks first gets to, gets to choose which of these I to C or G to F? G to F, okay. G to F. Okay. Now, does it, did it create a cycle? No, we added. Now, the next one is I to C. Um, does it create a cycle? No. Can I make that I capital? Okay, well, uh, I'll just redraw it a bit bigger. Okay. Okay. So does it create a cycle? No. So we add it. So um, what can we add now? Is there anything with weight three? No. There are two with weight four. What do people want? A to B. A to B. Okay. Okay, now there is another one with weight four. I should actually be checking. Uh, they have these steps in the book. Another one with weight four. Okay, is there anything with weight five? I don't see anything with weight five. Is there something with weight six? Yes. Do we add it? No, we do not uh, C, 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 C to F. Where is C to? Four, okay. 
We do not add it because if we did, it would create a cycle and that would break our solution. So we do not add it. So this, no. Now, um, is there anything else with six? No. Is there something with seven? Yes. Does it create a cycle? No. C to D, yeah, okay. Now, anything with weight eight? Yes. There's this and this. Which one do people want to look at first? I has seven. Oh, right, sorry, yes. We have to, we have to process this after this. Um, so we look at this, does it create a cycle? Yes, because it would create a cycle like that. So we don't take it. Uh, now there are two with weight eight, which one do we want? A to H, okay. Does it create a cycle? No. So now the next one is B to C. Now, if we hadn't done that, we could add it because it wouldn't create a cycle. But since we have this, if we add this edge, it creates this cycle. So we can't add it. Okay. I should have written cross goals over here. Um, so um, now what? There is nothing else. With it. Okay, wait, nine, D to E. Yes, does it create a cycle? It, it, no, okay, we add it. Okay, now 10, uh, 10 is E to F. Does it create a cycle? Yes, we don't add it. Um, 11, B to H, does it create a cycle? Yes, we don't add it. Uh, and then 14, D, uh, D to F, does it create a cycle? Yes, it creates a triangle, so we don't add it. So our tree looks like this. Okay, does it connect everything? Yes. Uh, so it's spanning, it's a tree, it's a cyclic, and we believe that it's minimum. Uh, yeah, uh, for something, not sure what. Um, so, um, okay, so how do we prove it's minimal? So, we're going to we're going to use this this template for proofs of correctness for greedy algorithms. Just going to see how much. I have to keep this timer because I think if I seven minutes. Okay. So before we process any of this, so the edges were in this sorted order. Right? So we're going to put the the edges. So the edges were in order, I, I could write them out, but that would, that would take, okay. So we, we, so you, before you do anything, you sort the edges. Um, and before you, before you look at any of the edges, your subsolution, your forest has no edges in it. So you can definitely add edges to get an optimal solution. So before you look at any edge, before you look at any edge, when you look at an edge, you decide either to take it or to throw it away. And irrevocably, you, you can't change it once you've made that decision. Um, so before you look at any edge and you make any decisions, you haven't made a mistake. Okay. So before we take any steps. Are empty 
sub solution can be extended to an optimal solution. Suppose that after I greater than or equal to zero steps, our subsolution can be extended. to an optimal solution So at some point, we've processed I edges. We've made decisions about these I edges. We kept some, we've thrown some away, and we have a forest, OK? And now we're going to process the I plus N. And we're assuming that after I steps, our, our forest can have more edges added to it to get a minimum spanning tree. Now we want to set, now we're going to process the next edge in order by weight. And we're going to either keep it or throw it away. So um, get rid of this. Everybody look at this. Um, I'm going to keep this because I'm going to use it, draw it again. But, uh, and do I need it? I can, I can just look it up again. So, we're looking at the I edge. Sorry, I plus first. The I plus first edge in non-decreasing order by weight. Cost. OK, now, if we look at it and we throw it away, uh, is that uh, uh, this is this is I greater than or, or, or equal to zero. Okay, yeah, so greater than or equal. So the base case we're taking care of after zero steps, we haven't messed up. So if we look at this edge and we throw it away, we would only do that if we can't add it to, the, to our subsolution um, without breaking the subsolution, without creating a cycle. Right? Because we look at it, if it creates a cycle, we throw it away. If it doesn't, we add it. So if we throw it away, Then it created a cycle. With our sub solution. Now notice that S, this optimal solution, contains our sub solution as a subgraph. All of the edges we've already taken are in S. All of the edges we've already thrown away are not in S. So if we can't take the edge, then S doesn't contain the edge. So I created a, created a cycle with our subsolution. And so also with S. Okay, 56, 55 seconds. Okay. So, S doesn't contain that edge. 
edge either. Okay, in that case, we get what we want. I plus one steps. We, we've shown that if we throw it away, then after I plus one steps, our optimal, sorry, our subsolution can be extended. to, okay, an optimal solution S prime. So if we throw, which in this case, S prime is just S, because if we throw the edge away, S couldn't have contained it either. So after I plus one steps, we can still, our subsolution can still be extended to S, okay? Now, here's the tricky case. Suppose we, which is not so tricky, suppose we take the edge, okay? Now, it's not guaranteed that S has to take that edge. Remember there were, um, there were oh, perhaps I erased it. Those were, there were those two eights, right? And if we took one, we couldn't take the other, right? So we took the one here, so we couldn't take the one here. So maybe S took the other one. So how do we argue that even though we differ with S on what we've done with this edge, we've taken it and maybe S throws it away and takes the next one, which we're not, which we can't take. How do we argue that you can and so what comes after so? And so also with S here. Yeah, okay. If we throw the edge away, then it created a cycle with our subsolution and so also with S. So S, okay. If we couldn't take it, S couldn't take it either. Okay, so what if we do take it So well, we're just worrying about this one thing. We've taken this one edge and S hasn't. And now we're gonna say, okay, but then we could take S and change it around so that it contains this one edge that we've taken and we haven't increased the cost, okay? So the, the argument to this is, um, I just have to remember that I'm teaching you yeah, this is, this is, yeah, Kruskal's, I'm, I'm not switching up Kruskal's and Prim's. This is Kruskal's. Okay, so suppose we take, uh, we take the solution S. So S is a tree. Okay, and now, So what we're going to do is in green, let's put the edges. Okay, so I'm going to do, I'm going to do this a little bit. Okay. I'm going to draw in green the edges that we already have taken. Okay, which are a forest little trees. And then in black, we're going to show the edges that S takes to complete our Yeah, okay. Okay, so in green are the, the edges that we have already taken. In black are the edges that S takes to complete the solution. And in red, which is unfortunately covered with black at the moment because I was 
writing over black edges. In red, can you see that? Can you see that it is red? It's pretty red. Yes, OK. So in red is this edge that we take that S didn't take. So imagine you take that edge and you put it into S's solution. It's going to create a cycle. Now, going around that cycle, consider the black edges on that cycle. OK? I'm going to argue that one of them has to be, one of the black edges has to be at least as costly as the red edge. Why? Well, if, if, oh, right, I have to, I have to start this thing again. I forgot. Um, I have to start this over again, reset and start. So possibly the little camera is going to be missing a little bit of this, but I was just saying that the, the, the green edges are the stuff we've taken, the black edges are the, the edges that S, the, the other edges that S contains, and the red edge is, is this thing, is this edge we've just taken, which is incompatible with S, it creates a cycle. Okay, so when you go around these, these black edges, well, actually all of the black edges, what can we say about their cost compared to the red edge? Watching the chat. So remember, we're processing the edges in order by, in non-decreasing order by weight. We have processed this green edge. So this green edge is, yeah, the green edge is cheaper than the red edge or at most as expensive. But these black edges, they cannot be cheaper than the red edge. Otherwise, we would have processed them first. So they're, they're, equal, their, their cost is equal or larger, okay? In which case, we can take any of these black edges, maybe this one, and we can erase it, okay? So uh, I'm gonna actually, this, it's dashed. Okay, we can just erase it. And that, now we get a tree, because if you take a tree and you add an edge and create a cycle, and you take another edge out of that cycle, and delete it, then you've got a tree, a different tree, but still a tree. Because the if you have n vertices and it's connected, well, you haven't disconnected anything because you've just broken a cycle. And you have n minus one edges, it's a tree. OK, so um, now we have this other tree. And the cost has not gone up because we've added the red edge. And we've deleted an edge which was not cheaper than the red edge. So the cost didn't go up. So we have another, so we have another solution which ex extends all of the stuff that we already took, the green edges, and it contains the red edge, and then it contains more stuff, and it's not more expensive than S, so it's an optimal solution as well. So we're going to call this S prime. OK, so now I need the space. Um, no, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it. OK, so if we take the edge, if S also takes the edge, fine, S extends a subsolution. If S doesn't take the edge, we can take S and do an exchange. This is, is called an exchange argument. And get a solution which is not more expensive than S, the solution S prime, so it's also optimal. And it extends our subsolution after I plus one steps. This is just ugly. I'm going to erase that away. So good. This is so this works whether or not we take the edge. So by induction, Kruskal's algorithm. produces an optimal solution. Because if 
if you don't, if you haven't messed up before you've taken any steps, and then if you haven't messed up by the i step for i greater than or equal to zero, then you don't mess up on the, the i plus first step, then you don't mess up. By induction, you don't mess up. So you end up with an optimal solution. You actually have to show that you terminate as well. That there are not an infinite number of edges. So yes, the algorithm terminates. Um, that's not an issue on this problem, but, but yeah, for stuff like network flows, you actually have to, it's sometimes not obvious how you prove termination. Um, so cross goes out. Now, I want to emphasize that this part, sort of this template doesn't change for greedy algorithms very much, right? I want you to learn this before we take any steps or after we've taken zero steps, our empty subsolution can be extended to an optimal solution. Assume that after I steps, our subsolution can be extended to an optimal solution S. Then this is the tricky part. You have to show this after I plus one steps, our subsolution can be extended to an optimal solution S prime. It's not enough to just say that, you actually have to show that because greedy algorithms do not solve all problems. So some people just say this, but you have to argue, for example, doing this exchange argument on the tree, why can I add this edge? Then I, then I can delete this other edge because we're processing this order, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now we're gonna do Prim's algorithm, which is similar, but this argument is a little bit tricky. So this, the argument for this step is sort of where you have to actually pay attention to what you're doing the actual problem you're working on. And then by induction, if you can prove this, then you get an optimal solution. I taught this a few years ago. And I every time, every time I teach this, like uh, you know, before we take any steps, blah 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 blah. And I hammer it in. And then on the exam, nobody wrote this. Nobody talked about before we take any steps, our, opt, our, our, our empty sub solution can be, nobody said anything about that. Why, why do you think I went over this so many times? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna ask, so you're gonna have to write something like this on the midterm, on the exam, whatever. Um, I, I don't just love saying this. Um, okay, so let's do prims. Um, so prims. And why am I showing you all these different algorithms for the same problem? Because they have different features, okay? I could almost leave this on, but just, just to sort of, Drive the message home, I'll probably write it out again. So prims, once again, we have the same graph. Which goes like this. And these two are not connected, and then it goes like this. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. I is connected to G. I, and this is H4. Okay. So, um, why would we do another algorithm? So, does the red hedge have a greater cost or the black edges have a greater cost? The black edges, because of the order we, we process uh, these, not these black edges, 
but but in the, the tree that was down here, the black edges we can say they do not they do not have a smaller cost. They might have an equal cost, but they do not have a smaller cost because if they did, we would have processed them first. Now, that argument is not quite going to work when we do the, the proof of correctness for prints. Okay, the the the, the, the circumstances are a little bit harder. Not much. Um, okay, so Prim's algorithm. Why would we? Why would we want another algorithm? Well, suppose that you're doing this this road paving thing, but your um, your road paving equipment is kind of fragile, and it can't go over dirt roads. Okay, it can pave a dirt road, but it can't drive along a dirt road and then pave something else. It can only drive, it can drive along a dirt road only if it's paving it as it's going, right? Because you have like some paving thing out stuck out the front and then your delicate actual paving vehicle goes on behind it on the paved surface. I don't know if this is realistic. Um, I'm a theorist, like I, I have never been in charge of paving anything, not even a driveway. Okay, but let's suppose that you have road paving equipment and it can't drive over dirt roads. So you can't do Kruskal's algorithm or like, oh, add this edge, now add this edge over here, because you, you can't get from there to here along paved roads yet. Just like imagine some situation where you want, you don't want a forest, you actually want a tree. Okay. Uh, where did people want their road paving equipment to be situated at the beginning? Just going to check that this is recording. Yes, it is. Um, so pick a pick a town from A to I. A. Okay, good choice. Okay, so in the beginning, the road paving equipment is at A. So. Um, Kruskal's al uh, sorry, Prim's algorithm says you have a tree. Okay, so at the beginning, your tree is just one vertex. It's not a forest, it's always going to be a tree. Now, you look around, and of all the edges incident to your tree, you choose the lightest one. Okay. And then, if it doesn't create a cycle, which means if it doesn't go between two vertices that are already in your tree, you add the edge. So what's the cheapest edge that's incident to this tree? Looking at the chat. There are two edges. One has to be okay. A B. Yes. Does it create a cycle? Does it does it connect two of does it is it between two vertices on my tree? No. So I'm gonna add A B. Now now I have two more edges, right? So it's um, so my, my tree. I'm just going to draw it down here. So I have A and B. And before I just had uh, AH and AB incident to, to my tree at A, but now I also have um, BC, BH, and AH. So uh, which so I actually have a tie. I have uh, two edges which are incident to my tree, which don't go between vertices of my tree. Um, actually, which one would we like to process first? B, B, C. Okay, so B, C spoke first. So B, C. So it doesn't it doesn't create a cycle. C is not in my tree yet. So I'm going to add B, C. Okay, and that adds, uh, that means now I'm also incident to uh, CI, uh, CF, and CD. Um, which one, uh, which edge is lightest? Now remember, we're still comparing with this edge, this edge, uh, okay, oh, well, just this edge and this edge are incident to A and B. Okay. CI, 
two, does it create, a, does it connect something to or something already in my tree? No. So I take it. Um, so now I get IH, IG. Um, what is the uh, cheapest edge incident to my tree? For C, do, do we compare it when summing the edge weights from A? No, no, this is, um, you're only adding things um, and you're just comparing edge weights by the You have to like keep sums later in the course when you're doing Dijkstra's algorithm, but not now. Um, CF, CF is a four, it's bigger than this and this and this, so yes. Does it connect some two things that are already in my tree? No. So I add CF, which is gonna be down here somewhere. Um, now, uh, this connects to FG and FE and, F and FD. Um, what's the, what's now the cheapest thing I can add? Uh, FG, does it connect to, um, is G in my tree already? No, it's not. So I add this. Um, now, and then, uh, now what? FG. So now it's my cheapest edge incident to my tree. Notice this is always a tree. Okay. HG. Yes. Is H in my tree? Not yet. I add this. Um, And then, okay, what's what's next? G H is some okay. Um, next, next edge this incident to the tree. Almost, but this one. What about this one? When um, it creates a cycle. So we're going to process IG next because I think it's next in order. And we're not going to take it because I is already in my tree and G is already in my tree. So we can't take it. It would create a cycle. Right. So now we, we consider CD. Um, oh, well, actually, we could consider IH. Doesn't matter. I mean, they're tough. Okay, we consider CD. D is not in the tree, so we add it. Uh, CD. And now we consider IH. IH is in the tree. I is in the tree. It would create a cycle. We don't take IH. And now we consider AH. A is in the tree, H is in the tree. You can't take it because it would create a cycle. CD is not a cycle yet. Um, I don't think I have any cycles yet. Um, okay, so we can't take AH. Uh, next thing is DE. Uh, D is in the tree, E is not in the tree. So yes, we can take this. And then actually you could notice that we've, we've actually connected everything, but we're just gonna run the algorithm to completion. Um, FE, F is in the tree, E is also in the tree. We can't take it, it would create a cycle. No. Um, and then the only other thing we consider DF, B is in the tree, F is in the tree, we can't take it. And we end up with a tree, okay? So um, this is not the same tree that we had before, right? 
because before we had this edge and not this edge. So the solution is not necessarily unique and it depends on how you break ties. Um, but, so, so this is, this is prims. So, so actually if we broke the ties, we could have got the same tree because of this, this, um, this example. So do people understand the algorithm? Sort of. I mean, um, it's, it's nice because you always have a tree. So your road building soft, uh, road building, soft, road building machinery doesn't have to, doesn't have to drive. If, if you, if it starts at A, then it goes to B and then, you know, later, so it goes to C. And then if it turns out you did CI and later you want to add CD, it just has to go back to C and, and add. So it just has to drive around a lot. Um, the way you stated it made it sound like you couldn't go back. Sorry, no, you can go back right? because um, because once you've paved this road, your road building vehicle can can cross it. Okay, yes, you can definitely go back. Otherwise, this wouldn't work. Oh, you can't go back in the sense that if you take an edge, then it's in your solution. If you throw the edge away, it's not in your solution. You can't change that decision. But if you take an edge, then, then you can later, just because I add CI doesn't mean I can no longer add anything incident to C. Okay. So um, just checking to see how much time we've got. Uh, four minutes. So, um, Ooh, this is going to get a bit tight. Um, so what's, what's nice about prints? You always have a tree, okay? What's not so nice about prints? Um, well, with uh, cross goals, you just sorted the edges and then you just process them in sorted order. In prims, you you have these and then you're adding the edges. So you're keeping a priority queue. Whenever, when I, first I just have a priority queue with A, B and A, H, with A, B with priority four and A, H with priority eight. And then when I connect B, I have to add uh, B, H with priority 11 and B, C with priority eight. So I'm using a priority queue instead of just sorting. So it sounds like there's, there's more of a headache with prints. Okay, so you can't just do a sort, you have to use the priority queue uh, priority queue data structure. Now, um, so, so there are pluses and minus. Later on, we're gonna see that cross goals is actually not as easy to implement as we think. Okay, but first let's do the proof of correctness for prints. Everybody along with me, before we take any steps, or you can write this when we have taken zero steps, which is the same thing, are empty sub-solution can be extended to an optimal solution suppose that after i steps our subsolution same stuff as before can be extended to an optimal solution X. Why did I erase this? Um, so I don't, I, I, as I said, I don't know why people didn't write this th those few years ago, because there's this rule that like, if, if, the, if the professor says it once, like, listen, if he says it twice, write it down. If he says it three times, it's gonna be on the exam. If he writes it on the whiteboard, multiple times, then it's probably going to be on the exam. Okay, so this is the problem. 
Um, well, uh, we show this is not quite the same way that um, after i plus one steps. So I'm just writing it. We show to to emphasize our sub solution. be extended to an optimal solution S prime. Now, we're going to sort of do the same thing. We have Now the green edges have to form a tree, right? Because after I steps, are... okay. Because after I steps, our sub solution in prims is always a tree. Okay, now in cross goes of the forest in prims is a tree. Now, S has some more edges. And we're going to say, okay, so if, um, if we consider, same, same thing as before, if we consider an edge and we discard it, then it created a cyclic connected two vertices that are already in the, the sub solution. So if we discard an edge, we don't have to worry about it because S couldn't take it either. Um, and I have to reset this, although the next time we run out of time, it'll be the end of the class. Um, so if we discard the edge uh, before our empty sub solution can be extended to an optimal, before we take any steps, our empty sub, yes can be extended to an optimal solution. Yes, yes, um, here, right. Before we take, oh, sorry, any steps. Right, okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, if, we, if we discard the edge, we don't have a problem as couldn't take it either. Suppose that we take the edge. If S also takes it, fine, great. Suppose we take the edge and S doesn't, S doesn't take it and takes something else later, which, for example, um, so it wouldn't happen here in this example with prims if you started A. Um, so, but, but it, it can happen. So, what can we what can we say about well we, we we imagine s and let's say that we take this edge and it creates a cycle well um can we say the same thing we said before that the black edges on the cycle have to be at least as expensive as uh, as the red edge. No, we can't, right? because we're only considering the edges incident to the tree. So, is it possible that the red edge has cost five, and this edge has cost three? Yes, that that can happen. Right, because as we're adding edges to the tree, we get access to edges which are cheaper. So we added this edge AB before we added the edge HG, even though HG is cheaper. So in Kruskal's algorithm, we were considering the edges. Uh, yes. So somebody just wrote, actually everybody can see this, the red edge was cheaper relative to all the edges we were considering at that moment. Yes, 
But that didn't include this edge. We were not considering this edge. So how are we going to say that we can, we can add this edge and take something away? We can break the cycle, but, but what? We can't just arbitrarily say, oh, we're going to take the, any of the black edges in the cycle. So in this case, um, then we must remove the edge three because it would have been cheaper at that moment. Not quite. Um, because remember, when we added this edge, we were not considering this edge and maybe, maybe we, and we weren't maybe considering this edge. This could be cheaper than five, two. This could be cost two. So we weren't considering this one. So, okay, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna, um, maybe this is what you mean. If you have a cycle, then you've got the tree and then you've got the red edge is incident to the tree. And then you've got some black edges, in this case two, but maybe more than two. So this is the cycle. And it touches, right? So you're going to have some green vertex here and some green vertex here. So the cycle has to leave the tree. At some point, the cycle also gets back to the tree. And then you have some edges in the cycle which are in the tree. So maybe you're not considering these edges yet because these could be cheaper than this one. Right? This could be five. And this could be three. But this one, uh, what? Kubone. Don't know what that is. This edge, there has to be one edge in the cycle, a black edge that's, that touches the tree, right? Because it's a cycle, it leaves the tree, it has to come back to the tree. So there has to be this edge that reconnects, and this one is incident to the tree when we're considering five. So that means this edge cannot be cheaper than five. It doesn't apply to all of the edges in the cycle anymore, but it does apply to this edge. So yes, we can say we're gonna add five and we're gonna take out the black edge in the cycle that's incident to the tree. And that, because we're processing, we're not processing them always in order of, of cost, but we're processing, but of all the edges that are incident to the tree after I steps, we're taking the cheapest. And that means that this one couldn't have been cheaper. So we can take that out. And now we get, okay, so, so now we get a sub solution. And now we get a solution S prime which is not more expensive than S and includes the red edge. So we have shown that after I plus one steps, our sub-solution can be extended to an optimal solution. Therefore, by induction, Prim's algorithm <clears throat> produces an optimal solution. So it's just the exchange argument has to be a little bit um, more, more specific about which exchange you do, okay? But you get this, this nice property that is always a tree. Now, um, we have 15, ah, okay. I'm not gonna teach you Barufkas. 
I'm going to have to leave Baruchas for the assignment because there's, I, I want an assignment question. Ooh, maybe I can put it on the exam. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I want to, I want to discuss the implementation of these algorithms. And actually, yeah, the implementation of Baruchas is also kind of sneaky. Um, so that's going to be on the, either the midterm or, or the, the assignment. Um, so PRIMS is pretty easy to implement as long as you have a priority queue lying around, right? Like a, a min heap or something like that. Okay. Cross goals. Let's think. So, so PRIMS, you, you, you just have your priority queue. And then whenever you, you add a vertex, uh, so you have a, uh, a list, say, say you have a, a list of the, the vertices which are already in your tree. Whenever you add a vertex, then you, you look at the edges which are incident to that vertex and you add them to the priority queue if you haven't already, um, if the other end is not in the list. But actually, if the other end was, was in the list, then you would, you would already have that edge in, in your priority queue. Prims, prims. Oh, Borovka. Yeah, if I put it on the assignment, I'll... Um, I think there might be an accent on the U. I'm not gonna, so this is a U and this is a V. I think there might be, there might be a little circle above the U or something like that. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a Czech or Slovak name. Um, ah, running out of time. Okay. Um, so, so it is uh, Borovka, I guess. Okay, with, with, the, with the, the U. Okay, so uh, with the dot. Oh, with the circle. Okay. Um, so let's talk about so cross goals. Um, it sounds like it's easy to implement. You just sort and then you process the edges. And for each one, you, you look at the edge and you decide, oh, does it create a cycle? Now, um, does it create a, a cycle in your forest? Now, in, in prims, it's always a tree. So what you can do is when you can, like I was doing, but sometimes forgetting to, whenever I visited, whenever I added a vertex to the tree, I colored it. So if you look at an edge, if the two endpoints are colored, then it creates a cycle, right? If one endpoint is colored and one endpoint is not, it does not. And you would never look at an edge where both endpoints are uncolored, unless you're like me and you forget to color the vertices. Now, cross goals, you have a forest, so the, the trees, you know, maybe if you look at two, it's like, well, I visited some vertex and I visited this other vertex, but maybe they're in different trees, in which case it doesn't create a cycle. So how do you tell if, it, if, if an edge creates a cycle? I mean, yes, you can do something like a breadth for a search, but this is going to slow down your algorithm, right? I mean, with this example, you can just sort of eyeball it. But last year, I don't know if you did I post the videos from last year. Last year, we actually had a case where somebody said, maybe me, add this. And then later we realized that it actually created a cycle. I don't know how we missed it in this, in this small example, but, but we noticed that, oh, we're going to go and add this. And then we noticed, oh, it, it actually does create a cycle. Imagine that you have a, a graph of millions of vertices and hundreds of millions of edges. How do, you how do you detect if an edge, adding an edge is going to create a cycle? Um, it's not that obvious, right? I mean, yes, if you, but if you, you can do the, the breadth first traversals or something like that, but, but this is not going to, you can work out the distance, the connectivities, but, but that's going to make your algorithm really slow. And it's going to make it much worse than, than any advantage of just sorting once and not having to keep your priority key. So in 10 minutes, I'm going to teach you the union find data structure. I'm not going to teach you all of the union find data structure, but uh, 
Um, so the union fine data structure, I think it's by later in Tarjan, it's definitely Tarjan. Um, I think it's Tarjan. Okay, so the idea is you, you keep a forest, right? So all of, for every tree in your, in Kruskal's algorithm, you're going to have a tree in this forest, but it's not going to look like the, it's not going to look exactly like the tree in, in Kruskal's algorithm. Now, um, so, so I'm going to have some little trees. Okay. Now, what I'm going to have is if I have some vertex, and these trees are not going to have constant degree. These trees can have really, really high degree. And in fact, sort of the best case is when they're a root and everything else is the child. Um, so let's suppose, let's make this W. X and let's make this Y. And let's make this this root instead. Okay, so what's going to happen? We're going to call the root if Y is in the in in, in in the tree that has root at Z, then we're going to say Z is Y's representative. Okay. Now, how? So this is union find data structure. Now, how do um, how do I find? So the find means I give you some vertex and you tell me it's representative. So when I start Kruskal's algorithm, everything is its own tree. Uh, so every every tree um, has one vertex. So everything is its own representative. Okay. So now in these trees. Uh, the pointers go up. So children point to their parents and parents don't know about their children. Okay, so the, the parents just point to their parents or if they're the root, they point to themselves. Children point to parents, parents don't point to children. Okay, so what's gonna happen is if I say find Y, it's going to give me Z. If I say find W, it's going to give me X. Okay, people see how this works. So how long does it take me to get from Y to Z? Well, it takes me um, if there is If Y is Z's grandparent, it takes me two operations. Y looks at its parent. Uh, so if, if I want to find the representative for Y, Y looks Y asks his parent, his parent look, uh, looks at its parent, and, and his parent Z is pointing to itself. So Z is the representative. Okay. Yeah, this is gonna be a little bit tight. Okay. So W, if I say find W, W is pointing at its parent, its parent is pointing at its parent, its point, parent is pointing over here, and this is pointing, and X is pointing to it. So if I say find W, you walk up, and you find W is represented. Okay, now, what if I say union um, W and Y? So this means I'm going to take these two sets. So now I'm adding some. Uh, the, I'm adding the edge between W and Y in Kruskal's in in, uh, in in the forest in in the minimum standing tree graph in the graph. And <clears throat> so now I want these things. They're going to be the same tree. Okay. I'm going to put the trees together. So the this is a representation of sets, and I'm unioning two sets. So children point to parents, parents point to either parents point to either their parents or they, if they're the representative, they point to themselves. So everything in the tree points to its parent and the root points to itself. 
had four minutes. Uh, okay, so um, union, you're going to take, when I do two unions, if I say union Y and W, first what I do, I find the representative of Y, I find the representative of W, and then maybe, and then I'm going to make, oh, so that should be red. I'm going to make one of the representatives point to the other one. So if I make X, if I decide to make X point to Z, now the next time I say find W, what's going to happen is going to go here and here and here and here. When it gets to X, it's going to go here, and then it's going to Z is Z points to itself. So it's going to say, oh, the representative of W is Z. So this sounds really easy, right? I mean, if, if I say find, you just walk up to the root of the tree. And if I say union, you, you find the roots of the two trees, and then you make one of them point to the, to the root of the other one. But that sounds like it could be really slow, right? Because if, if you do this badly, you're gonna end up with a degenerate tree. And uh, uh, you're gonna have to, if I say, uh, what if I say find W, you walk all the way up. And then I say find W again, you're gonna to have to walk all the way up. So there are two tricks that make this really fast. So um, I'm gonna need a few extra minutes. People who wanna leave at 12.55, please leave. Um, I'm just gonna keep recording to, to actually get this in because I think we started a couple of minutes, recording a couple of minutes late. Okay, so the first, there are two. One is, um, So in the book, I think it talks about union by rank. I'm just gonna say union by size. So suppose um, I always take the smaller tree. When I do the union and I'm thinking about whether I should make X point to Z or make Z point to X, I'm always going to take the smaller tree and make the representative of the smaller tree point to the representative of the bigger tree. So, of the smaller tree point to the root of the bigger tree. So why, why does that help me? Well, imagine that um, you're a W and now you started out with just this one vertex in, in, in the tree. So every time you go up, it signifies the time you did a union and you stuck two trees together. I'm gonna sneeze again. Uh, but okay. And why does W point to this? Because this tree, at the time when you did the union, that tree here was at least as big as W's tree. Now, once you've done the union, un uh, this thing, including W, is never gonna get any bigger because you're never gonna add you're never gonna have anything point to W because you only ever have a representative point to a representative and W is not its own representative anymore. So now once, if I decide that X is gonna to point to Z, nothing, nobody else is ever going to point to X, only the things that currently do, okay? So for every step I go up, it means I'm following uh, an arrow, uh, a pointer from a tree to a tree which was at least as big. So because the, the tree I'm going from doesn't grow after that, the other tree is always going to be at least as big. So that means every time I cross an edge, 
So for every edge I cross walking up from W to its representative, the size of the subtree rooted at the vertex I'm visiting has to at least double because here, let's W had some, some little tree. Okay, so, so W had some little tree and this now, once I've unioned, this tree was bigger, so the, the two trees together are at least twice as big as, as W's tree. And then this tree has to be at least twice as big again, because this, this subtree was bigger, this tree was bigger, and this than this tree, so that the union of the two was at least twice as big as this tree. So how many times can you double before you have before you get to the to the root well only log n right like if you have n vertices or n n elements in your your the universe then how many times can you can your subtree can the, the trees be doubling in size log n so if you do union by size how long does it take you to walk up to the root o log n Okay, so this means union by size, find takes O log n time. There is another trick. So just this is enough for most of the stuff we want. Um, but there is another trick which is called path compression, which, oh, what did I draw these? So when you're, when you're going up from W to, from W to Z, what you're gonna do, yeah, okay. You have, you have X, and then you have all these vertices on the path from W on the path from W uh, to Z. When you walk up, you after you walk up, you walk back down, and each of these is now going to point directly to Z. Right? So you're never going to walk from W to what was its parent ever again. Um, this trick is called path compression. And with this trick, um, it turns out that you get, I don't know if you've seen amortized analysis. I don't have time to teach it to you now because I'm over time. Um, maybe it can be in the tutorial. Yes, let's put it in the tutorial. Yes, that would be good. Um, uh, path compression, you do this trick with path compression, then you can show that you get um, amortized, amortized, not worst case, but amortized O log log n. Actually, in fact, log, you get something called log star n. Log star is called the iterated logarithm. And it means the number of times you have to take a log to get down to one. So this isn't going to fit in this in this class. This is going to have to go with fit into the tutorial. So you get amortized log star in time. This is in the book, and it will be in the lecture notes. And then in fact, you get something called uh, it's actually even better than that. It's something called inverse Ackerman. 
um, which is alpha. So it's, it's not constant, but it's as close to constant as you could ever possibly want. So it's amortized. Um, so M operations, you get, for M operations, you get inverse Ackerman MN. Um, so it's very, very close to constant. Um, but proving that is not easy. The, it's not in the book. In the book, they just, I think they just proved log star. I'm not gonna prove it in the course notes. Um, okay, so that's how you implement cross -ups. Um, Questions? Is anybody still here? Twenty-two. Uh, Twenty-two people. What is uh, when is assignment eight as the solutions? Um, I think pe uh, some people have extensions are still turning it in tonight. Um, so I haven't written the solution. I, I wrote like a draft of the solutions, but I have to write them actually up a solution key. Um, it will be. I have to give a talk tomorrow. So that's why I'm a bit behind. I was preparing slides. Um, so everything, oh, the little camera, it sounds like it just stopped recording. Um, so yes, I'm a bit behind. Uh, and I have to prepare a midterm for next week, but I'll, I'll try to get the solutions. Once, once everything's in, I have to write, this, I have to write the key for the, the marker anyway. Um, anything about, so, so implementing this, understanding why this works is not so easy. Understanding why union by, by size gives you longer rhythmic time, that's not too bad. Understanding why path compression works, that is mm, not something I'm ever gonna ask you to remember. Um, mm, I'm not even gonna ask you to remember. I'm not even gonna ask you to implement path compression. Um, but yeah, so that's, and cross goals is very fast because it uses the sneaky data structure. And one of the learning objectives is to learn the sneaky data structures to make your algorithms faster. Um, okay, questions about minimum spanning trees, cross goal, prim. Do you see why it's good to have like, you have two algorithms for the same problem because they're different. How does this help with cycle detection? Oh, did I, I skip that maybe? Um, because what you're gonna do is if, if you add an edge, in, yeah, this is gonna be in the course notes. If you add an edge in with cross pulse algorithm, so, so before you add the edge, you wanna know if, if the two, uh, if it's gonna create a cycle, which means if these two, if these two vertices, the two endpoints, are in the same tree, do they, they're in the same tree if they have the same representative? Because every tree in uh, in cross in, in the graph corresponds to a little to a tree in this data structure. So you say, okay, I'm I'm thinking about putting an edge between W and Y. So you say, find W, find Y. If they have the same representative then they're in the same tree. So adding an edge, adding that edge would create a cycle. If it comes back and says, oh, the representative of W is X and the representative of Y is Z, then you say, okay, so I'm gonna add that edge to, to the graph with cross goals out of them. And now you say, okay, but now I'm going to union those two sets by saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the uh, representative of W, which is X, and I'm going to I'm going to union the two sets. So I'm going to make if depending on the sizes, say say that x is tree is smaller, then I'm going to make x point to z. So now if I ever say y and w again, then it's going to come back and say yes is the same representative. So if I'd already connected, so if, if y if I'd already connected uh, y and P and P and W, then you can see, and then P is connected to some other stuff. Then, then if, if these two had, um, then these two, if they're in the same tree in Kruskal's algorithm already, they would have the same representative. 
So if you just use union by size, Kruskal's algorithm is going to run in log n time. And if you use path compression and you can sort quickly, then it's going to run in. Mm, well, if you can so sort in almost linear time, it's going to run in almost linear time. Okay. Yeah, so Kruskal's looks cool until and super easy until you until you realize that this cycle detecting whether an edge would create a cycle requires this data structure that doesn't get taught in second year. Um, so now that I'm not I'm being recorded here, but I'm not being recorded on a little camera. So I do think that that uh, whoever teaches second year should be teaching AVL trees because that is something. The second is, is a second year subject. Um, union find is, is, I don't mind teaching union find data structure because I'm teaching algorithms, but this, this yeah, fine. This is a data structure, but it, it, you teach it when you teach Kruskal's R. Um, I don't blame whoever taught second year for not teaching union find. I just blame them for not teaching ABL trees or red black trees. Uh, okay, so I am way over time. Ah, I'm so far over time. Okay, I'm going to stop this recording. Um, goodbye, everybody. Stop recording. Thanks. Sorry about running over time again. Yes.